I want to start out by saying that Snow White is not one of my favorite fairy tales. It is, however, a story that contains several fairy tale motifs, and that makes it a good story for discussion in terms of talking about various fairy tale motifs. So that's what I'm going to do is go through the story sort of chronologically, talking about the motifs that appear, as well as some other interesting observations that I've made. And of course, I will share with you my reasons for not particularly liking Snow White. To start, we'll talk about the evil stepmother, very briefly because we've discussed this in previous videos. I do want to say that in the first edition of the Grimm's Kinder und Hausmarken, or Children and Household Tales, that was published in 1812, the queen who wishes for the child as white as snow and the queen who orders Snow White's death are one and the same. It is her biological mother that is trying to have her killed, and it's not until subsequent additions that the Grimm's change it to a stepmother in order to soften the story for children. It's a good reminder of the fact that these tales originated um, much earlier than when the Grimm's are putting them to paper, and they originated in communities where the original audience was a mixture of adults and children, probably more often adults, and that some of the changes that develop in these stories are intentional changes brought on by people like the Grimm's or Perot because they are tailoring the story to a particular audience they have in mind, in this case, children. Now, the Huntsman is tasked with um, killing Snow White. The Huntsman could have been like the cook in Sun, Moon, and Talia, who you'll remember was tasked with killing and, of course, cooking Sun and Moon, but he doesn't. He saves them by placing them with his wife to take care of them. The Huntsman, while he doesn't kill Snow White, he also doesn't save her. He sends her off into the forest, knowing full well that she is likely to be killed there by wild beasts. So we cannot view him as any sort of heroic or sympathetic character. In fact, I would argue that he is in some ways emasculated because he's not a man of action. In fact, most of the story is really a story just of the Queen and Snow White, and the men, until you get to the prince at the very end, are emasculated, because the dwarves are also emasculated, because they're dwarves, and to Grimm's audience, that then automatically means that they're no threat to Snow White, and it becomes acceptable for her to be living with them. The Huntsman is tasked not only with killing Snow White, but also with procuring her lung and liver for the queen to eat. Now, we know, obviously, that he kills a boar, and the queen is actually eating a boar's lung and liver, but she doesn't know that. That's dramatic irony. She believes that she's feasting on Snow White's organs, and we have then, of course, the motif of cannibalism, which when we read the juniper tree, I said, shows up much more frequently than you would realize, particularly if your only exposure to Snow White is the Disney version. Of course, they cut that out. Um, here, cannibalism not only serves as a one of many reminders that the queen is incredibly vile. But here I think the cannibalism can also be viewed as that type of cannibalism where the practitioner believes that by eating their victim, they are taking on some aspect of their victim. And here I think the queen believes that she is taking on some of Snow White's beauty. And that makes me wonder if this story was not in some ways influenced by the real-life story of Elizabeth Bathory, who was a Hungarian noblewoman who killed lots of virgins and bathed in their blood as a way of retaining her youth and beauty. She is a character who shows up in books about vampires if they have a chapter about real-life vampires. That's certainly a very interesting story to look into if that seems like something you would want to pursue on your own. Certainly I don't think it is a stretch to think that she may have influenced 
this story or similar stories of actual cannibalism may have influenced some of the stories that contain cannibalism. Now, while the queen is feasting on Snow White's, supposedly Snow White's organ, Snow White uh, escapes into the forest. The forest is a setting that shows up so frequently in fairy tales um, because it is a setting that facilitates the motif of separation from parents. The forest stands in stark contrast to the village or the town. The village or the town is a place of civilization, of law and order, of safety, of the known. The forest, on the other hand, is wilderness. There is chaos or a lack of law and order, and there is the unknown. There is an air of mystery, and there is certainly the potential for danger. The forest is where Hansel and Gretel meet the witch. It is where Little Red Riding Hood meets the wolf, and it is where Snow White, had she not been so beautiful, would have been torn apart by wild animals. This separation from parents shows up so frequently in fairy tales because it is required for the child to come of age or often also for just any a hero of any age to sort of go on their hero's journey. Separation from parents appears in other ways in fairy tales as well. One example is anytime you have a stepmother, you can argue that that is a form of separation from parents because the original mother has died. The reason it shows up so frequently, besides the fact that it facilitates that coming of age, is that it makes it a very interesting story for the children who are reading it. It's why fairy tales are so popular with kids, because they can live vicariously through that character and think about the actions that they would take if they were in a position where their parents weren't around to guide them or interfere in some way. There's a reason why orphans show up so frequently in literature, particularly young adult literature. I mean, from Harry Potter to Anne of Green Gables to Pippi Longstocking, but even in, you know, more, quote, adult literature like Oliver Twist and Jane Eyre, I mean, it's, the list goes on and on. So she's separated from her parents or from her stepmother. She's all alone in the forest and she comes upon the, the dwarves who take her in. Now, when they first discover her, it's very similar to Goldilocks and the Three Bears because there's this, uh, who's been messing with my stuff and going through their house and finding all of the things that are messed up until they come upon the girl in the bed. They allow her to stay because she is such a beautiful creature. And they're nice, I suppose, but it is certainly consistent throughout the story that Snow White gets, um, grace extended to her and mercy extended to her because of her beauty. It really is about the only thing we can say about Snow White, except for one brief little mention that the Grimm's slip in of her saying her prayers before she goes to bed. And that is definitely something that the Grimm's intentionally add because they are expecting these stories, particularly each edition that comes out after the first edition to be sort of instructional for children. It's the same reason that they include in their version of Cinderella um, her mom telling her, make sure that you're pious. Um, but let's be honest, it is not the fact that Snow White is pious and says her prayers that the huntsman spares her life. That's not the reason that the dwarves take her in, and it is certainly not the reason that the prince falls in love with her. Beauty is the only thing she has going for her. So they, she's hanging out with the dwarves and they warn her, don't open the door to strangers because your, your stepmother is probably going to come looking for you. She disobeys them. And you can maybe cut her some slack the first time that it happens because the queen is disguised and Snow White is only seven years old, which is something we'll talk about some more in a little bit. But the second and third time, I can't cut her any slack. I think she's just not a very bright person. And even if she was incredibly naive to continue to believe that these women who are showing up at her door are not the queen, she's disobedient to the dwarves. If she had just obeyed them, 
then she also would not have gotten into this mess. And I'm really bothered by the fact that all of Snow White's poor choices go unremarked upon by the Grimm's, and they're ultimately not even punished, except for, I mean, yeah, she dies, but at the end, she's woken up and marries a prince. She doesn't seem to really be punished for any of her missteps, even though some of those missteps are the same as the Queen's. The first two attempts that the Queen makes on Snow White's life are appeals to her vanity. Now, vanity is the thing about the queen that makes her so evil. That is her motivation for wanting to kill Snow White, and that is her great sin, and that is why she is punished. And that is a recurring theme in several fairy tales. It's the same thing as the stepsisters in Cinderella. In fact, these two tales are very similar in the sense that you have, in both of them, you have women who are beautiful, who want to be beautiful and who work toward being beautiful and they're vain. And then you have women who are beautiful and they maybe don't realize how beautiful they are or they certainly aren't working very hard to be beautiful. And it's the women who are desiring of that beauty, who are seen to be vain, who are the villains and are punished for it. But Snow White doesn't need new laces for her corset when she's just hanging out in the forest with these dwarves. Same thing with the comb. So those are, the, those are both appeals to her vanity that the, the Grimm's don't editorialize on the way that they do with the Queen. The, the Grimm's have some side comments about the Queen. For example, when they say, um, and then her end envious heart was at rest, as much as an envious heart can be at rest, right? There's definitely these little comments and the, this tone that is judgmental of the queen, but is not judgmental of Snow White in the same way, even though she, by desiring those laces and that comb, is exercising a kind of vanity. Then we get to the third attempt with the apple, and here I want to say I think it's really difficult for people who grew up in Western culture to read Snow White and not pick up on the parallel to the Garden of Eden. Now I know that in, in the Bible it doesn't actually specify what fruit, but through most of the history of Western art, it's depicted as an apple. And in the garden, you have this explicit direction, do not eat this, and then they eat it, and it brings death into the world. Same thing here. She's given explicit directions. Don't open the door. Don't talk to strangers. Don't take anything from them. Disobeys, eats the apple, dies. So don't be surprised when you see these kinds of parallels to the Bible or see Christian symbols in fairy tales because these originated in medieval Europe. So of course they're going to be influenced by like Christian thought. She dies, she's put in this casket, even the forest animals mourn because she's so beautiful. And then later on a prince comes. And here's where I have my biggest issue. Snow White is seven years old. So this prince comes, he sees this dead girl. So even the fact you know that she's dead, she's in a coffin that raises some issues of like necrophilia, but she's also a girl, literally a girl. Only one of two things could have happened. If we want to try to do some mental gymnastics and try to make this acceptable, we could pretend that because the Grimm's don't specify how much time elapsed between Snow White's death and when the prince comes, let's make it 18 for modern age of consent laws in most states, and pretend that 11 years passed and that over the course of those 11 years, Snow White continued to grow and mature even though she's dead. That would mean that 
A, the dwarves put her in a coffin that was big enough to accommodate that growth, and B, they're watching this growth appear, but don't mention it. I mean, there's no, there's no indication in the story that that would have happened. And so we're o- we can only believe that she is seven. She presents as a seven-year-old in this coffin, in which case, what is this prince thinking? And this is the reason why you won't find any Snow White movies that are true to the story in terms of her age. They always start her off older when she's with the queen. You also can't even try to pretend that maybe she spent several years with the dwarves before the queen came to kill her because you know that queen did not wait 11 years to ask the mirror again whether she was the fairest. So you can't even try to make that mental leap. It's a huge problem that the story has. It's one of the reasons why I don't like it. But again, it's one of several. The other being the extreme emphasis on Snow White's beauty and the fact that we have a character who literally has nothing going for her except that she's good looking. She doesn't seem to have any sort of personality. She's clearly not very bright. She's not even obedient. And she also displays some of the negative characteristics that ultimately condemn the queen. She's vain. But let's pretend that there aren't any issues with her marrying the prince. Let's let's pretend that she's of age and there's nothing weird about him falling in love with a dead girl. Um, She is woken, of course, you'll notice, not by a kiss. That's something that Disney did, sort of following in the footsteps of Sleeping Beauty. And honestly, um, the, the kissing a dead girl or a sleeping girl or in any way some unconscious woman that you don't know, um, today we recognize that's actually assault. And so I'm glad that the original version has a different way that Snow White is woken. It's actually one of the good things about this the story. Now, in the first edition, the prince has his stewards move the casket from room to room so that he can like look at her. And eventually one of the stewards just gets sick of it and he slaps her and that knocks the apple out of her mouth, which is pretty funny. But then obviously subsequent editions, it is, you know, one of the stewards is clumsy and just drops the coffin. She wakes up, they're going to get married, and you'll notice that the mirror doesn't say that Snow White is the fairest. He calls her the young queen. That way, the queen has to go to the wedding to see who this person is that has surpassed her in beauty. And that then sets the stage for the queen's punishment. Now, her punishment, I think it's important to recognize that the shoes are not described as iron shoes that they put in the fire until they got hot, but as iron shoes that they put in the fire until they got red hot. The red here is important because I think it serves as a foil to the red of Snow White. So red is one of those colors that has a lot of different connotations, both positive and negative. And here, the red for Snow White is obviously positive. It's, you know, her her cheeks and her lips, and it's a sign of her beauty and her health. And by extension, we then associate it with like love and romance, the red of Valentine's Day. The red hot iron of the shoes conjures ideas or a mood of anger and rage. And that fits the queen because that's certainly what she experiences every time she looks in the mirror and he says that she's not the fairest. She falls into this rage and determines that she's going to kill Snow White. So the fact that they are red hot um, is very fitting and serves as sort of like a bookend to the red at the beginning that is symbolic of Snow White and her beauty. It's also important that the queen's execution is public because her sin is vanity, and that is something that is always put on display. The queen is 
certainly as the most beautiful woman in the, in the world, is not someone who has hidden herself away, but certainly would have been someone who put herself on public display as much as possible to show off her beauty. And so it is also fitting that her death is put, her execution is put on public display, where she is made to dance before the wedding crowd. Imagine being a guest at that wedding. Um, you want people to look at you because you're so beautiful? Guess what? Now people are really going to look at you uh, until she drops down dead. Obviously it's a very gruesome death and there's a reason why, again, Disney changes it in their film to make it even more child-friendly. But it is, I think, a very fitting death for the Queen. So those are some of my views on this story. Again, not my favorite because there are things that are super problematic in terms of obviously her being seven and her being dead and her being literally objectified, right? Um, and then also she's just not a protagonist that we can, what do you do with a protagonist? The story is named after her, but she doesn't, do anything good. <laughs> She's just pretty. Um, it's really hard to get behind a character like that. But I hope that this has been enjoyable and has at least, you know, brought into mind some of the fairy tale motifs that show up in Snow White and gets you thinking about them as they show up in other tales. Speaking of that, there are some motifs that I didn't talk about here, and those are numbers that show up in Snow White. For the purpose of time, I decided to make a separate video about numbers that show up as motifs in fairy tales, so be looking for that uh, coming up soon. Like if you like this, subscribe for more videos, and until next time, I wish you a very happily ever after.